Okay, everyone, I think uh, most of us are now in the virtual room, so uh, we'll make a start. Hello, everyone, Croeso Kennedy Baub. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you and thank you for joining our Collega Cymru Teaching and Learning Network Teach Meet. I'm Kelly Edwards, Director of Development at Collega Cymru, and we're grateful to Welsh Government for funding these events as part of the Teaching and Learning Network. The Teach Meets are designed to provide an opportunity to share good practice and to support knowledge exchange between FE and work-based learning colleagues across the FE sector. So just to note, your microphones and videos have been switched off for this event. This afternoon, we're pleased to welcome Glenda Dowdell-Thomas, Teaching and Learning Mentor at Colleague Sirgar, Colleague Ceredigion, who will be chairing today's session. We'll hear from members of our Northwest Network of Colleges, Group Llandrill Lomenai, Colleague Sirgar, Colleague Ceredigion, and Neathport Talbot Group of Colleges. We're grateful to them all for their input. And now I'll hand over to Glenda. Hello all, welcome. Um, I hope you're going to get a lot out of this evening. We've got eight great presentations uh, from lecturers from a number of different colleges and they're going to be sharing ideas with you. Some of them will be brand new and some of them will be things that you haven't used in a long time and it'll be a good reminder for you. So without further ado, I want to uh, welcome Vinny. And Vinny's going to be looking at developing self-reflective independent learners and she's coming all the way from India so she's making our teach meet very international. Welcome Vinny. Thank you, uh, thank you Glenda. So without any uh, further ado I'll start sharing my screen. Please do let me know if you can see it. Um, I think I can see it. Hopefully you can do. Good. So just give me a minute. Yeah. So thank you for this Teach Meet event. Uh, today's uh, presentation is about developing uh, independent learners who can reflect and actually reflect. And I say self-reflect, and you know, students do reflect on many things, but about themselves. Uh, and using feedback as a dialogue. So it's not one way, but it is multiple ways. I am Gapan and I am a lecturer as well as a deputy program area manager at Group Clan Reclai Ross Campus. Um, alongside that, I'm also putting on many other hats of uh, being a PGC cross group coordinator as well as uh, HE coordinator at the moment. My email address is v.ponnalakan at glf.at.at if you to contact me regarding anything. So student feedback to teacher is key to any success, but it is uh, the more we uh, have, the education has developed, we have, stri we have understood that it is not just between teacher to student, but it is the other way around, but also between the learner and the group of learners or the community of learning which we create for our students in our classrooms or on an, on an online platform or a forum, all those things. So the group is talking to e between each other. The groups are also giving feedback to an individual learner, but the group is also giving the feedback to the teacher. So when that triangle of you know going backwards and forwards, that feedback is going on, only then we can see some success um, uh, for any student um, independent learner where they are making decisions, they are thinking what they need to do to progress themselves, whether it is skills-based, whether it is knowledge-based, how they go about it. So, um, what I use in my classrooms, and I'm sure many tutors do this already, is to have student-friendly comments. The comments should be uh, concise and clear so that they engage with it, but they also sort of easy for them to remember and they understand it. Um, model to develop self-assessment, that is, how do you teach them how to assess they are lacking in some skills or they need to develop some skills or they need to improve on certain skills. All that the teacher or someone who is as the facilitator is teaching those skills to the students. Uh, peer assessment or the feedback of a group between each other individuals as well as to a particular individual, for example, if they're doing a presentation and the class is giving a feedback, we need to teach them how to be constructive and how to give that feedback to their peers. And that comes with practice as well. So there are a lot of things which you do as a teacher in the classroom, which helps uh, build up that confidence, that learner, 
and help them develop as an independent learner. Um, ask learners for feedback. I absolutely ask them about a strategy I use. I also ask them about assessments I'm planning, many things. So the students are constantly talking to me and they know that it is an platform for them to raise concerns or something which didn't work for them. And that's also a point for me to discuss with them and explain to them why that strategy or why that particular, uh, you know, uh, style of teaching was used. And if it is not suitable for that cohort of learners, I would change them. But I always try to tell them why that activity was important for them. And all these things obviously take time. We need to plan time in our schemes of work and uh, make sure that we are devoting that time for self and the peer assessment in classrooms or even outside of classrooms. But in classrooms works for some students. Uh, and group participation, everybody participates. They give feedback to you, but they also give happy to give feedback. And that rapport between the tutor and the students are going on. I'm going to show you some examples here. Uh, this is an example where a student is setting their own targets um, based on feedback on questions, which was given to them in the classroom. And at the end of the uh, page, you can see the ones written in blue are the, question, the targets which the student has set for themselves based on how they have done in that test. So I didn't have to tell them, but this takes some time. This couldn't have been done in September. This was sometime in October, as you can see the slide there. Uh, but by then the student has developed enough to write short uh, comments or short targets for them. So one way of, you know, you can see how they have uh, done it, but I also give them a small feedback alongside and these were all done using Google Classroom. Uh, here is a template which I'm, I'm sure many tutors, teachers might be using it. Um, I have used it for years, but I keep modifying it depending on the level of the course I'm using, whether it is a level two course, level three, BTEC, uh, A-levels, even level four numeracy. Uh, I just keep changing it depending on what the criteria is and it always works. Uh, showing you an example. So everything which is in black is done by the student first and then I put on my comments. So here, aspirational grade, it's not the target grade, but it is the aspiration of that student. And sometimes it's also an opportunity for me to discuss them if they think they are at a lower, sometimes students put themselves quite low and I'm like, you can do better than this. So it is a lot of motivational talk going on, uh, many other things which helps that student. And same thing, revision on a scale of seven, 10. Whatever they put, you can have a discussion there, uh, score. But importantly, the area they need to know they to do. If they are putting something, what I need to improve under what I need to improve, which is you think that it is not really clear enough. And it also gives you an indication the student doesn't understand how to improve. And there is again a discussion for you to do with the student. Um, some more examples. So I hope I'm not taking too much time. Glenda, just wave uh, if it is the case. Uh, feedback on, on short assessments. So they did short as, uh, assessments towards the end of last year. And one of the things I did was ask them feedback. What do they think of it? How did it work for them? And these are two different cohorts. And um, one of the students on the right-hand side uh, was a student who had a learning need and many other issues, but actually absolutely loved it because they could engage with it and they could spend the time and get the most out of them, uh, those assessments. Uh, the last one I've put here is a peer assessment, which I actually use with my foundation year students or BTEC students. Um, they are doing uh, substantial pieces of work where they have to write, and I just get them to create a peer assessment, uh, you know, template, and then they use it. And it is nice to get them to share the uh, documents, line the numbers, and then they give the feedback. And, um, and so this is a process where you show them how to do it, and they do it, and they engage with it. And they start asking you questions. They start telling you what they have to do. And that's how we develop a self-reflective independent learner. And that's what we want them to be able to apply their thinking skills to uh, the subject, but also to improve themselves to whatever they want to do. And I'll stop with that. Thank you, everyone. Any questions? I'm happy to answer. If there is still time, Glenda. So 
If, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat. We've set um, our presenters quite an impossible task tonight because in the, within the rules of Teach Meet, they've each got five minutes. And I think that as educators, we find that very difficult. We think five minute, minutes is hard to fill, but actually it goes really, really quickly. So our next up, our presenter is Ang Harid, and Ang Harid is going to be looking at critical thinking at A-level. Over to you. Ang Harid, are you on mute? And how are you there? I'm here, yes, but I can't, I can't seem to, sorry. That's okay. Hang on a second. <laughs> You're stalling for more time, I know you. <laughs> Good, I can see your presentation. But you're on mute. Whenever I share my presentation, it goes on mute. Okay, then. So maybe if I go to um, Gemma, and then maybe if um, Nia, could you, um, would it be possible for you to share Rang Harrod's presentation for her? So I'm going to go to Gemma, and then we're going to come back and try you, Rang Harrod. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so Gemma, are you ready? I am, yes. Thank you, Bernanda. Thank you for having me today. I'm going to share with you my use and experience of using visualizers um, for modeling and feedback. Now, if you are as old as me, um, you'll remember OHPs, the overhead projectors and the joy of acetates. Uh, my first teaching position saw me utilize these dinosaurs of the teaching world for modeling uh, how to annotate a poem uh, before the school invested in the interactive whiteboards. Um, so you can imagine that I was um, working across the kind of change in education with this and even then modeling live was something that was part of most sessions i must confess to being somewhat jealous of my colleagues kit from you know in biology they had body parts and you know some of my uh, geography colleagues would have great colorful chalk creations on their boards showing volcanoes and such uh, whereas for english um, unfortunately just words and more words so uh, fast forward to three years ago and Twitter opened my eyes to the new kid on the block, the visualizer. And now Twitter was a buzz with these great options this small device could offer for modeling, demonstrations, and even showcasing students' model answers on the screen for everybody. Now, whilst most classrooms have and had interactive whiteboards or projectors onto the dry whiteboards in the college, some classrooms were moving to using the larger television screens. And, these visualizers offered a new way of interacting through these, as well as removing some of the need for the learners to gather around you know, when it came to a demonstration um, during the session. So I, um, well, I went back to Twitter um, because Twitter was very much about how these visualizers could be used in primary schools and secondary schools. But I wanted to know more how they could be used in FA in sixth form. So I conducted a small Twitter poll and I targeted FE tutors through the various hashtags on Twitter. So UK FE chat, Amplify FE and Joy FE. Now, this is the stuff that came out. And it was really interesting to see because it seemed that Twitter were echoing my purpose in wanting to use a visualizer. And so I approached the college um, to bid for some funding in order to trial um, to see how it worked in the classroom uh, initially for English. So as this image shows, uh, I don't know how clear this is, but what I used to do was I'd project um, examples here. This is a poem onto my large whiteboard and I would break down complex writing tasks. It wasn't a case of just analysing the poem, but it was actually showing the students different ways to set out their essays. As you can see, setting out the argument, uh, looking at the beginning of this poem. And I loved the projector on the dry whiteboard approach, but it doesn't actually translate particularly well for those learners 
who've only got a question booklet or an A4 sheet of paper in front of them. The joy of the visualizer meant you could capture that booklet or that book page much better for the learners. And then when you're doing these complex tasks, they can appreciate that demonstration much more effectively. And this is true of showing the workings maybe for a maths paper question using the space provided. Or an example uh, I saw the other week where in law they were completing an N1 form for civil litigation topic and it would have really enhanced that. Um, so it's, it's something that I felt quite strongly about. And then I also looked at whole class feedback. Now, whilst only 14% of the teachers stated they used the visualizer for whole class feedback in FE, my learners really enjoy the dialogic approach where I can share Polaroid moments, as I call them, real work that they've done, good practice, and also where marks can be gained. Now, Vinny alluded to this earlier with student feedback to tutors, but it also allows me to ask those students what I can do in my own explanations and modeling approaches to better support them. And as you can see on the screen, using a whole class feedback form and their books under the visualizer to present for them. Now, there's lots of different uh, uses for them, but I think one of the most important things, and everybody's experienced this sudden switch to remote learning during lockdown. What that meant for me was that precious visualizer that I'd bid for and that I'd been using was locked in my classroom on campus. And as great as Jamboard and like that, I really felt I needed uh, my visualizer to enhance my synchronous sessions because it's so much harder when they're online trying to explain to them this is how you do it, which in a classroom, there's much more of that interaction. You can re read their sort of faces and so on. So one of the things that I did was I um, purchased something called a mirror cam. And uh, this portable visualizer was the, sort of the next best thing. And dare I say, I ordered it on Amazon on next day delivery because it was the only way we could access them at the time. Um, and it was great. Uh, it's a top image. I just popped it over the webcam and I was able to share my screen. And you can use it on a phone, uh, an iPad, wherever there's a fixed webcam. And the other thing is that now is fabulous when I'm moving across campus and I'm going into classrooms without a visualizer, just pop it in my handbag or in my pencil case. Um, and I can use it because the college have got the software installed on all those computers. And there's lots of different ways that you can show learners how to, to do things. So on the, the bottom picture, the folding frenzy, doing it live, folding it with them, showing them, modeling those um, strategies is really useful to guide them. And then they can go on and do their own work and then reflect on that. Now, an important thing to remember is that they aren't a magic fix. You know, it's not the best tool out there for everyone and everything. They do actually need to serve a purpose. So it might be that a free app, a Chrome extension, or even a YouTube video clip might be a better approach for your subject's demonstration. So you really do need to think about its use and its added value to your session before investing. Obviously, that said, for my subject, which is very much the written word, it is invaluable to enhance in the learner experience. And then obviously my own teaching ability when I am limited by the screen that I've got available. So on here, there are some links and I will pop them in the chat for everybody. And here you can read more about the research behind visualizers with modeling of writing um, and look at some of uh, the strategies when you're using visualizers in the classroom. And I'll pop the link as well so you can have a look at the mirror cams and my own email address in the chat. So if you do have any further questions, you can contact me um, using that. Thank you very much, Geoff. That's lovely. Thank you, Gemma. Okay, we're going to go back and we're going to try Ang Harrod now, who's doing critical thinking in A-level, and hopefully we can get that working. So we've got the presentation there. Ang Harrod? Can we unmute Ang Harrod? And Harrod, I can hear you now. OK, 
Okay, have we got on Howard there? Okay, I think I'm going to go down the list and then I'll come back to Anharad and see what we can do there. So next up, we've got Selena and Alison, and they're going to be using a playlist as a transitional tool. So Selena and Alison, are you ready? Love, you're on mute. Great. Selena's there. Lovely. Okay, so you've got five minutes, Selena. Let's. let's uh, hi, yes, yes I'm on. going first. Sorry. Okay, yes, so I'm just trying to unmute myself then. Okay. Okay, hi. Um, Hello there, um, Selena and I are going to be talking to you about playlists that we use as a transition tool um, from GCSE to A-level. Um, in a moment, Selena's going to be going through an example with you um, uh, a, 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 about a playlist, but we use playlists because they are delivered remotely. Um, can you hear me, sorry? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. I'm sorry, I hear something in the background then. Okay, I'll start again. <laughs> so Selena will be going through an example with you in a moment. Um, we use playlists. Uh, they are delivered remotely using the Welsh Government um, Hub playlist platform. Um, and playlists are a, a fantastic interactive tool and it makes all the learning, it keeps all the learning in one place for easy access for the students. Um, the reason we use them, well, they are a fantastic try before you buy approach at the college. We discourage students from studying three new A-levels and we encourage prospective students to look through subjects that they are interested in, which gives them a taster before they choose their options. And that will hopefully then limit the changes to courses which are detrimental to student learning because they miss so much um, at the beginning when they transfer into a new course. Uh, we also hope playlists will help prospective students to successfully transition to a higher level of study expected of them at the college. And also playlists are a great marketing tool for open evenings, as students can be directed to the playlists before they arrive um, at the evening. Um, just a few more things to mention about that before I pass you to Selena. Um, when we develop a playlist at the college, what we're aiming to do is to address typical gaps in students' knowledge. It's not a live lesson, which you'll see in a moment when Selena shows you some playlists on biology and criminology. Um, I'm gonna hand you over to Selena now and I'll pop a link in the chat for you as well so you can play around with it too, okay? Thank you. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen with you and Okay, so you should see that um, now. So once students click on the link um, or scan the QR code, as Alison's going to share in the chat, we should do this. Should they should um, arrive here at the landing page? Um, now we share this link in um, open evenings, uh, school visits, or marketing events. Okay, so when students arrive, uh, they go. They can scroll down here. And we've got the A-levels and GCSE. It's worth pointing out that in addition to our A-level playlists, there are playlists that focus on skills um, developed from GCSE maths and English that are needed for different A-levels, such as statistics for psychology um, or synthesize for A-level history. OK, but we're going to be looking at the A-level playlist here. Um, so by clicking on A-levels, you then get a menu of our A-level subjects. Um, it's intended that the playlist itself should take around two hours um, for the students to work their way through. And it will resemble a sort of typical lesson structure. So we'll take a little look at biology. OK, so hopefully you can, um, you can see that. Okay, so the first page then for the playlist itself, once you've set it up, the first page uh, gives an overview of the lesson, details of what the students should already know, and perhaps some resources, what they might need. So, for example, if they need pen and paper or calculator, etc., they'll know from the beginning what they need to collect. Um, Making the subjects come alive for the students is something that we aim to promote here at NPTC. Um, and we do that by personalizing our videos. So if I show you a, a quick clip here, um, 
just show you how it starts. Before we start today's activities, we're going to quick recap about enzymes. Um, you should remember. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop it there, otherwise we'll have a lesson about enzymes. Okay, um, but the idea here is that it puts a face to the subject um, and it personalizes that uh, subject as well so that the student is actually being introduced to the lecturer beforehand. Okay. Um, and as you can see, we've used the PowerPoint to create a video here. Um, on the next one, what we have is um, another video, but we've included a uh, Microsoft form here. So the student then can do some self-assessment on the, on the task that's being you know, discussed. Um, the idea is, is that these small tasks give students a feeling of accomplishment as they move through each item. Okay. And I think if we just look at the end, the tasks ideally go up in structure. So they go from um, a sort of complex, um, sorry, for a simple task to a sort of complex task at the end. It's also good if you have more than one in a department because um, another, you can add another PowerPoint in there for another member of staff. Um, so it's an effective way for staff to work collaboratively, uh, sharing good practice and, and resources. Um, and then obviously you can include exam papers at the end, um, you know, giving st students a flavor of what to expect at the end of their AS levels. Okay, so um, essentially this is how we bridge the gap between um, AS, uh, sorry, GCSE and AS level at uh, NPTC Group. Thank you. Deal van Vaur. That's lovely. Thank you, Selena. Thank you, Alison. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat. I can't promise that we can answer all of them, but if the panelists pick them up, then they may be able to answer those questions afterwards. Okay, next up, we've got Emma, and Emma will be looking at Word War. Are you good, Emma? Yep, I'm good. Um, just checking that everybody can see my screen. Yeah, we can see it. Cool, okay. Um, yeah, so I'm Emma Good from Neath Port Albert College. So I'm the senior, one of the senior lecturers in charge of teaching and learning. And I'd like to show you one of my current favorite websites uh, that I use at the moment called Wordwall. So Wordwall is a tool to make colorful, interactive custom activities for lessons. So there's a myriad of different types of Wordwalls that you can make. Um, so you need to sign up to the website, but it's free. OK, and there's a good load of different types of activities that you can choose from to make. OK, so there's like matchup activities, you know, we've got anagrams if you want kind of simple activities, there's word search it searches, you know, find the match with doing different questions, sorting activities, you know, images, true or false, so loads of different types. So it's just a really good variety of different quick, colourful little activities you can do with the students, um, maybe at the beginning of the session, you know, maybe for plenaries. For, I do it for a lot of my students when they're working together, you know, for peer work, group work, bits of stretch and challenge, which I'm going to come on to at the end. OK, so rather than work through a PowerPoint, I thought that I'd show you mine. So this is the setup of mine. Um, I'd like to just quickly pop a link in the chat to a word wall that I'd like people to do, if you can. So I'll bring it up on my screen while you are hopefully having a little wander through it. So the one that I wanted to share with you is a Christmas quiz uh, that I've prepared. So it should be a nice, easy, quick little quiz. Okay. Um, if you click into it, then you'll be able to see that it can be used quite nicely. Let me mute it. So this is a find the match activity, nice and colorful comes up with questions, um, you know, that you would obviously then answer. And there's lots of interactivity with this because you can send it out to students and share, like I've just done with you guys, get the link, pop the link in wherever, and you don't need to be 
a member of the website to play the link. And when you send it to the students or send it to other people, if you look at your version, if anybody's opened it up, you can see on the right hand side that you can switch the templates. So you can play this game that I've just sent to you in whatever template you choose. So these are all the different templates that are now available for this particular game. This is why the website's really good, one of the reasons why anyway, because you're able to choose whichever format you want to play this in. So if this didn't suit you as a find the match activity, you know, if you didn't want to pick icicles or whatever, then you could choose to play this as like a matchup where you wanted to match them up instead. So it's good for students because it can play to their strengths. They can play it in whichever way that they want to do. Hopefully people are doing that now at the minute. We'll see anyway. So if I scroll down, nobody's completed it yet. This is how I can tell if people are actually listening. Uh, then there's lots of options for the game. So you can choose to put a timer on, you can choose the layout, you can choose the level of difficulty that you want to make for your particular activity. If I go back to find the match, Okay, then you can see that you can have a certain number of lives, you can dictate the speed of the game. Oh, people are playing it, excellent. And an important thing as well is the leaderboard, because I know that some students like to compete, others don't. You can choose whether to put your time on the leaderboard or not. Okay, another really good thing that I like about this as well is if you do make an account, then you, know, you can obviously play anyway in the different formats, but you can search activities yourselves. So students could download this activity that you've sent them. And in your account, if you go to edit content, you can save the game yourself and you can change it. So you can change the format of it. So if I wanted to edit this, I could change all of the questions if I wanted to. I'll just change one or two to a format that I'd like. And that saves that to my area then. You can search. If I wanted to search enzymes, uh, key stage five. Everything that anybody's ever made will be available that you can download, edit, change into your own format so that you've got it there. So that's in community, which is a really nice little function. So the way that I use this for students is that I would generally set them an activity. So I may want to set them, you know, I could pick one, but if I set somebody for something for my activities, I might set them a respiration quiz. I can see a few of my students have done. They could play it in whichever format they wanted to. For stretch and challenge then, they could change the format. You know, they could add some more questions onto there, work in pairs, work in groups to carry this out activity as they wanted to do with my class did this last week um, as an activity between them in groups, deciding what to sort, where to go, to be able to push them then, you know, when they download, they can make more questions of their own, um, tweak this version then to however they want it. And then when I really want to stretch and challenge my students, so I do use this for stretch and challenge a lot, is that I'd get them to make their own quizzes. That's the aim with where I'm getting at for this. So all my students have downloaded this and they all use it. They, they have to pro provide me with some word walls or cahoots or whatever that they've made to try and stretch them and make the questions as difficult as they possibly can. And then we play them in class. So it's just a nice way to kind of flip it so that the students get to make their own activities as well. And it's nice and colorful, as you can see. So it can be used as plenaries, you know, used during the lesson, group work, lots of different ways that they could be played, you know, fully interactive, fully managed by whoever wants to play these games, that they can edit them, download them, link them, share them. So you don't have to play this in the format that you get it. It can be in whatever format that you want to. So lots of ways to go with this, but generally it's really good for stretch and challenge. I really like uh, these word walls. So my contact details, if anybody wanted to contact and speak further about this is emma.good at mptcgroup.ac.uk. Thank you. We seem to have lost Glenda. Um, Glenda, are you still with us? 
No, okay. Um, if we can move on to the next presentation. Ellie, I think it was maybe meant to be me next. Uh, okay, great. Thank you, Michael. Okay. I'm uh, back. Tech <laughs> issues are fantastic, aren't they? Don't you just love it? Okay, so I'm going to introduce you formally now, Mike. Okay, That's so no problem. Next, we've got Mike Hackford, and he's going to be looking at a 20-hour revision plan. There we go. One second, guys, for me to get set up here. There we are. I hope we can kind of... Can I just check and make sure everyone can see my screen? Yeah, we can see that. That's great stuff. So guys, thanks for uh, thanks for having me uh, talk to you tonight. My name is Michael Hackford. I'm a lecturer in A-Level uh, at Colleague Sir Gar. Um, this is uh, uh, something that was born out of a program I did at the college last year called Action Research, um, and it was uh, it was designed to um, to be looking into sort of like on the ground research into uh, into um, uh, into better habits for the students or, or to an area of uh, interest for me. Um, my starting point for it was. Um, was obviously like last year, like all every A-level A learner um, uh, in, from 2019, uh, from 2020 rather, they were coming in in September of last year and not having sat um, formal exams. Um, and there's obviously a, a really uh, worthwhile debate as to whether or not formal exams are the, the best way to, to uh, assess knowledge. Um, but one thing formal exams uh, usually do for, for A-level students is it, is it locks in that, uh, that information ready for the next year uh, through that kind of what I've called a, a crucible by fire. Um, and so as they came in next, uh, the next year, I was uh, really aware that I was uh, nervous for them because uh, we had still planned on having uh, end of year um, assessment in 2021. Uh, and I know that uh, I got an increasing sense from them that they were very nervous. Uh, they were very unconfident in their abilities, um, partly for those reasons um, that they were going to be, they thought they were going to be sitting exams in year two without having experienced that in year one. Um, my, uh, I'm not sure if you can see these, my original aims for the project that I was, uh, that I was looking at um, was going to be for, uh, to, uh, I come for myself, but increase student autonomy in their studies, something that uh, give them a, a tool that they could use, um, providing those tools with something they could use to improve and give them a visible record of their progress. And after a bit of thrashing around, I came across a TED Talk. I love a good TED Talk, me. Uh, and I came across a, a TED Talk by a guy called Josh Kaufman. Um, and he was talking about skill acquisition. Um, and he was talking about 20 hours to learn anything. Um, but some of the processes he was talking about, this idea of 20 hours to essentially get good at something, um, was really appealing uh, when I was thinking about how to target uh, my students, um, that confidence gap. And he broke, uh, there's a, a YouTube video, um, a link there that you can follow. You can just Google uh, Josh Kaufman 20 hours and, and it'll pop up as a TED talk. Um, but he, he broke that process down um, uh, into uh, acquiring skills in 20 hours uh, through deconstructing the task, breaking that one, that lump of skills up into a set of smaller skills, learning enough to self correct having some uh, resources to hand removing barriers uh, to um, removing barriers uh, to to practice um, uh, physical barriers but for for my students and it was also those sort of like emotional uh, or confidence barrier and then focus practice for 20 hours and what I came up with was a, a two-part approach that I put in front of my students um, and I, I just gave it the name of 20 hours to confidence because the learners, that's what they were trying to build. The, 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 the knowledge they, they felt like they had, and, and that was exhibited in their work, but their confidence in, in expressing that knowledge in uh, an exam setting was, was really what they were keen to work on. So I, I came up with uh, this sort of like a 20-hour plans, uh, which I gave to students. Here's an example of uh, one that a student developed themselves. And the idea was that what they needed to do was to pick a dedicated time they were going to be, um, they were going to be working, uh, an activity, something they were going to be doing. Um, I added the next thing, though that's very much in line with what Josh Kaufman's talking about. I, I, I had the next thing. I wanted to, uh, to distinguish the tasks of what am I doing and also the product. What at the end of this time have I produced? Um, because I think a lot of times with revision, um, we tell students to go off and revise. We don't always um, give them tools on how to do that effectively. Uh, and so one thing I really steered them towards was that they had something that they had finished at the end of that, uh, that dedicated time. Um, what were the barriers they were likely to encounter? 
and how to um, how to adjust or manage those, uh, and then tracking their their cumulative hours. And that twenty hour plan worked um, uh, for the the. I didn't make it compulsory for the students. Uh, it was an opt in uh, project, but um, but the um, uh, two one the students that engaged with it said that it, it took their their revision process uh, and built their confidence in po in, in positive uh, positive ways. So I was really pleased with that. The second part uh, I added to that was uh, in terms of them building stuff. Um, I also had, uh, asked them to, some of them had the opportunities to build Google revision sites, and that was used in tandem with their, their 20 hours, uh, the 20 hour plans. Um, so, uh, so at the end of that, there's a little bit of feedback I won't go into right now, but, um, but uh, where they started versus where they, they end up uh, was, uh, was uh, you know, took positive turns. And, and sort of at the end of that year then of uh, implementing that and reviewing that with the students, Felt like it increased their autonomy. Um, it, you know, it certainly provided them with uh, with simple tools, uh, and it gave a, a, a visible record of their progress. Um, so that is really my that sort of twenty hour revision plan in a nutshell. I hope I didn't rattle through that too quick, um, and uh, happy to take any questions if people have them. I think you hit the five minutes, Mike. That's quite astonishing, really. Boom. <laughs> Known for my timing, Glenda. <laughs> That's great. If anybody does have any questions, put them in the chat. Um, towards the end of the session, I think what we're going to do is give people the opportunity to put their email address in the chat as well so that they can make connections with people who are here as attendees, but also to anybody who is presenting tonight as well. Um, OK, so next up with multi-sensory feedback, we have got Rodri. You there, Rodri? Yes. just. Brilliant. Share my screen. Um, <clears throat> can everybody see my screen now? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, it's okay. Um, sorry, uh, it's available in both languages, but I'll go through it in English just to save time. Um, so what, what I mean by this process is um, just an overview of it. Um, I'll, I'll walk you through it first and then I'll talk about the, the, the benefits if you like. Um, so this is how I get my students to hand in their work. We use Google Classroom here, so they'll go into the classroom, click on classwork, um, click on the assignment, and then add work. Um, and that's the, sorry, there's some building work going on. <laughs> that's the first scan there, tick there, add another page here, um, flipped over, take the second page. And then the advantage of this is that the, the, um, their work is automatically added to the assignment so I can then access it digitally. Uh, so that's the work there. They can check it as well just to see that it's scanned properly um, and then submit that. Um, so if I go to the next slide, sorry, there we go. Um, so the work then is marked digitally on the digital copy. Um, and what that entails is uh, process like this so I'll have this is the work handed in um, I've got uh, one of the artist um, what do they call XP pen um, tablets so I can write directly on the that's the tablet there um, I can write directly on the digital copy uh, again an advantage is it's it's automatically attached to their um, to their assess, uh, assignment within Google Classroom um so in in this example here i'll just i'll just forward through it a bit quicker so there you go that, that's been marked there and then it's automatically uploaded you can see the save changes at the top there of the video um and then uh once that's handed in i then record a loom video so i'll mark a batch of assignments and then i'll record a feedback video uh for each assignment um so the advantage of that, um, well, two, twofold in, in terms of they've got the visual and the uh, audio feedback, so they can see and and hear me talking about what, what where they need to go next. Um, the feedback is always attached to the assignment, so it's it can be revisited, where, for example, as part of revision. Um, and it's easy and quick to give detailed and uh, specific individual um feedback in a, in a quite quite a short space of time 
it's not practical for every single task, but at end of unit uh, assessments or assignments, I tend to give them quite detailed feedback. Only about three minutes, but you can do a lot in that time. Um, so here's an example of, of feedback given to a student. So um, what's nice about this, I use Cammy as the software to, to write on. Um, it's, it's free for 90 days and then it's something like $99 for, for the rest. But even without, even if it's not matched digitally, if it's just scanned in, then this process again, using Loom um, to record, um, I can draw their attention to a particular question um, so if I go here, um, I can actually move my video image as well, right next to the question that I want to discuss. So, um, so that's the, uh, the, the, the idea behind it, really. Um, so the advantages again, well, it, it's not exactly dual coding in terms of it's not them doing the, um, doing, doing the, uh, writing and the, oh, sorry, the speaking and the imagery, but it, it is obviously because they're getting both both through the ears and through the eyes, um, then the feedback does seem to help uh, most of them, and, and I've got positive feedback from them about the process, and actually um, I was uh, remotely um, visited by Estin during the lockdown, and they gave positive feedback as well on, on this practice. Um, in that it really helped um, helped learner motivation more than anything because it's it's individual. Um, they they really like uh, they really like that attention and the detail that I can go into, um, which would obviously take much too long in in, in class to to do in in, in the same way. Um, so that's my that's my very brief uh, sort of overview of it. If you've got any questions. As, as always, that's my email address on the page there now, um, and also, also to be added to the uh, to the list, I think, in the chat at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Rodri. You've got a question here. What was the pen called again? Sorry, I muted myself. Um, it's an XP pen. The one I've got was quite expensive, but there's quite a cheap one. It's about fifty pounds. It's basically a, a graphics tablet. And I use those with with students in class. They 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 use them to to write on PDFs and so on. XP Pen, I think it's called the Deco Four, the, the cheaper version. Uh, the one with the screen is a bit more expensive. It's about a couple hundred quid, I think. Um, That's great. Uh, and there was a not to you, Roger. This was there was a question to Selena and Alison. I'll give them a chance to come back in after Nicola. Um, someone's asked. Um, how are analytics gained from playlists? So we'll come back to you after um, Nicola's presentation. So up next, we've got Nicola and she's looking at class point. You good to go, Nicola? You're on mute. Okay, I think we might be having the same issue as we did before with Anne Harrod because you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm on mute now. Sorry. Yeah. I'll just go back to sharing. Okay. It's just got to restart the PowerPoint. Okay. Sorry. Right. Okay. Right. I'll just share it now. Sorry about that. It's okay. Okay. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yes. Great. Okay, so my name's Nicola Hunter. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about Class Point, um, which is a way of making your PowerPoint interactive. If you have uh, a device, another device next to you, maybe your phone that you could um, access, class, go to classpoint.app um, and you will see that there is a code generated um, on the screen. These codes are generated automatically. If you could go to classpoint.app and input that code, if we have time at the end of the PowerPoint, there will be a question in which you could have a go and putting your answers in. So as I said before, this is an interactive PowerPoint. It is really easy to, to use this package to turn your PowerPoint interactive, which obviously is great 
be used when students are working remotely, but it can also be used within the classroom as well. So I'm just going to show you some of the ways in which I have used it in a classroom. So I've used it for short answer questions. Um, if you've got a PowerPoint already and you just want to add a short answer question or just turn a question that you've got already in a PowerPoint into um, a short answer question, all you need to do is to click on the um, icon, the short answer icon, once you've installed ClassPoint onto your computer. What happens then is that the students would be given a question slide and a text box in which they could answer their questions and type their answers in. What happens is that their short answers, their short answers appear on the screen. Um, and what you're able to do is to go in and like those comments. You can download the answers and save them into your PowerPoint. You can also delete an answer, um, which sometimes I do what, once I'm at the stage where I want to save the correct answers into the PowerPoint. But it allows you to see every student's short answer, okay? Um, which obviously if you're working remotely, you can also click in and see which student sent each answer. And you can go in and sort of click on each one and spotlight each answer. Um, answer that's there. Another way in which I've used ClassPoint is for um, a multiple choice question and turning that interactive. Again, it's very easy if you already have a um, multiple choice question in a PowerPoint, all you need to do is click on the multiple choice icon um, and it will insert the, the blue um, sort of button at the bottom of the screen where it says multiple choice. Again, this allows you to um, make your um, PowerPoint, again, the multiple choice questions interactive. You can set your answers as well, so you can put in the correct answers. When students have um, answered the questions, um, you can, or while they're answering it, you can see um, the sort of bar chart appear on your screen to see what the common answers are. Um, it does allow you to look at it in chart form. You can also look at it in a table format. You can see who has written in wrong answers um, and you can download the responses as well. Um, it also allows you to set it in competition mode. So if you're building up a few questions and you want it to be competitive, um, you can set that in competition mode and students can compete against each other. Another way in which I've used it is for um, mind mapping. This is a way for students to be able to visualize um, sort of mind mapping. So I just asked them, uh, one of my A-level classes the other day, we were talking about revision, and I just asked them what sort of revision techniques they used or they thought they could use. And these are the answers that they gave me. Um, what happens is the if, so for example, flashcards is bigger than the um, other ones. That means it's been put in the most. So the more um, common answers you get, the bigger the words get in the mind map. Um, you can click on a word to see how many times um, it has been put in. Um, and to see, you can also click on word, each word to see, um, and it'll tell you the name of the student that inputted that response which can obviously I mean it's quite useful if somebody for example has put um, a joke answer in um, you can actually go in and see who has done it as well what I really like about using um, the this is called a word cloud what I really like about using word cloud is that you again can insert the students answers and you can save it into your PowerPoint. Um, what is really good about ClassPoint is that they provide a huge amount of tutorials that you can use to help you learn um, each section of the um, 
the package. So, and it's really straightforward to use. So they'll do a separate one about how to set up a multiple choice question. Then they will show you um, one about how to turn it and make it competitive. And I've also just screen um, screenshot the toolbar um, as well. Um, if we have got time, if you could just answer this question, do you think, in oh, oh, hang on, sorry, bear with me. Oh, oh, sorry, the question, if I could just quickly share that again at the end. No, I haven't actually got the button on here to make it interactive for you. Um, sorry about that. Um, I was going to get you to have a go, but um, the screen sharing's gone a bit funny and I can't get you to do it. So once you've got the question there, if I'd clicked the blue button, what would have happened is you would have been able to insert your answer um, and we would have been able to watch the graph, um, the chart appear, but um, it didn't work. Sorry about that. That's not a problem, Nicola. We've got a question actually. Is it only PowerPoint that it works with or would it also work with Google Slides? Um, I've not tried it with Google Slides. Um, because I don't use that. Um, I've only tried it with PowerPoint. Um, it is, it's something that you download and install. Um, so it would be worth trying it, but I've only used it with PowerPoint. Great, thank you. Sorry. Sorry, Glenda, you're on mute. Okay, did you not hear any of that? <laughs> I want to thank everybody for their contributions tonight. I know it's it's quite a hard thing to do to come on after, after a day of work and then come to pre present to everybody, but it was fantastic and there's lots of great ideas there. And thank you to everyone who joined us as well today. Um, if anybody wants to put their names in the chat, please feel free to do so. And over to you, Kelly. Thanks, Glenda. Diolchen Vaur Pawb. I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for joining us today for what I think you'll agree has been a very useful and enjoyable session. Uh, apologies for we've had some technical issues, but um, it's it's been a really, really valuable session. And I think what has struck me is the variety of approaches and innovative approaches that, that people have shared with us and uh, really appreciate um, people's generosity really in, in sharing their, their practices. So I think it's been a really valuable event. Um, I'd also like to thank Welsh Government who've uh, funded our Teach Meet events and to Glenda for chairing the event so efficiently. And finally, I'd like to thank our Northwest uh, Network of Colleges for bringing real insight and sharing some excellent practice with us this evening. We have one final event in the new year, the details of which we'll, we'll share with you soon. Uh, I think it's around February time, so we can, we can share some further information with you. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, please contact our communications manager, Lucy Hopkins. Her contact details can be found on the Collega Camry website. So just like to say thank you very much and uh, thank you for joining us. I hope you found the event very useful and informative and have a good evening. Dioch. <laughs>